Welcome to our show. All the good ones are taken, commonly known by ourselves as at Goat. I'm Megan. And I'm Alex. And, and this, this is, is our podcast. podcast. Before we get into today's book, here's a little bit about ourselves. I am Megan, and I'm a business professional, and I read to escape the monotonous, repetitive day-to-day of the business world. How about you, um, Alex? I'm Alex. I'm an ABA therapist, and I read because I like escaping reality. And what does ABA stand for again? So ABA stands for Advanced Behavioral Analytics. Oh, cool. So I work with children. Aw, fun. Yeah. Um, okay, Megan, so how was your week this week? Well, I've had a actually pretty eventful week. I've met three semi-famous people, so yeah, that was let's talk cool. about that. Um, I got to see one of my favorite authors, Allie Hazelwood, at her book launch for Love Theoretically. Mm. Um, she is a like steminist romance author. She's very good. I've read everything that she's written so far. I just I love absolutely that. love her. Um, and while we saw that um she had two other authors with her both are locally based in that area and i got to meet one of them and she is a harvard lawyer so that was really Ooh. cool um and i definitely want to look up some of her books she's uh her name's katie shepherd i think she's released one book and she's working on releasing her second so she's an up-and-comer uh it was really cool i have a picture with both of them good i'm glad you took pics yeah it was great and then i got all of my ali hazelwood books signed so that was really cool Yay. and then Yesterday, for our friend's birthday, we went to see a stand-up comedian named Sam Talent, who I had never heard of before, and I'm not, like, a super comedy gal, so I was like, this is going to be... Who is this? <laughs> <laughs> but he's got the perfect name for it, literally yeah. Sam Talent. Okay. I know. <laughs> well, and I, like, I even brought our book, like, this week's book, just in case it was going to be garbage, and I could just, like, <laughs> sit in the back and read <laughs> But he was actually really funny, and at the end, he uh, plugged his book, and so I got his book uh, signed and a uh, picture with him, too. So that was pretty cool. Uh, how about you, Alex? How was your week? It's been a week, for sure. It sounds like you had a very literary field week, I so I love that for you. Um, yeah, just work for me. Yesterday was my grandpa's birthday. He turned 83 years old, Ooh. so shout out to Papa. And it was good to see all the fam. Um it's just funny, like, when you've known people that long, like, to see them, like, how they've changed over the years mm-hmm. and stuff. It's just nice to, like, reconnect with fam who kind of, like, live far away. I will say I had a time getting here today oh, to your me. home. Okay, so I have this really bad habit of, like, never properly filling up my gas tank, <laughs> like, ever. In fact, it's such a problem that I've run out of gas on multiple roads many times before because I don't know what goes through my mind, but I'm literally, like... Oh, like, there's enough gas to get me to, like, X, Y, Z. Like, I don't need to worry about an hour or whatever when I really just need to fucking pull over and get gas. Like, it (laughs) takes two minutes, right? So I'm going down. I literally just left my apartment. And I'm going down the road. And I can't turn my steering wheel anymore. And my car has, like, completely stopped in the middle of the road. And I'm like, fucking great. What's funny is there's a Bucky's gas station right. right across the road from my apartment. And I was like, okay, so I can just push my car there. <laughs> okay. Just little old Alex just pushing Did you your, really car. <laughs> your car. <laughs> no, I didn't push my car. <laughs> Fuck no. Luckily, this tow truck driver man, like, saw me struggling in the middle of the road. It's 100 fucking degrees, by the way. It is garbage. Garbage weather. And um, he, like, pulled up to the side of me. And, of course... Throngs of people are, like, behind me, like, honking, like, throwing up the, like, what's happening sign. I'm like, relax. Like, can you see I'm a struggling girl? And so he pulls up to the side of me. He goes, beep, beep. He's like, hey, you need some help? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, okay, I'm going to charge you 50 bucks. I'm like, okay. Um, That seems a little steep considering that the Bucky's is literally right across the road. But essentially... He hooks up my car while I'm in it, which I do think is illegal. Like, I definitely don't think you're supposed to be in the car. Like, yeah, as you are pulling it up the ramp. You paid him for this? Yes. (laughs) We had to make this fucking podcast. I was like, (laughs) any way to get there. And so he pulls me up with the chain onto his car, rumbles us down the road to Bucky's, (laughs) and then I go and pay him, and then I leave. So that was my that was my journey here today. So yeah, but I made it. 
<laughs> and here we are. <laughs> so I think uh, our producer and my husband, Shelby, right now, he is just giving daggers at me through this wall because I absolutely am that type of person who is like, it just said, like, it just gave me the warning. Like I have like three more drives before yeah. I need gas. And Shelby's like, before it even turns that sound on, you have to get gas. Like you need to get gas now and we just never do it. No, absolutely not. <laughs> I don't know what it is with me. Like it, like I said, it literally takes two minutes and it would have saved me $50 and the stress, but <laughs> Anyway, it was a time. I'm here now. And now I have a drink in my hand. We're recording. It feels good. It feels nice. Well, Alex, you made it. You're down 50 bucks, but you've proven your dedication to this podcast. That's fucking for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Never doubt, people. Never doubt. So how about you give us a little taste of today's book? Okay, perfect. I'll dive right in. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools, the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player, that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Chills. I know! (laughs) I'm excited! Okay. And our first book is... Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. Yay! And that was a quote in the book, and it's also a Shakespeare quote that was in the book. Yeah, multi-layered quote. Yep. So, very cool. Okay, yeah, so what are your thoughts on this book? Like, Well, so let's start with our one-sentence synopsis. So we had a couple different... Um, iterations of this i guess so Mm -hmm. um while alex and i were planning for this podcast we came up with a couple different variations but um our producer and my husband shelby just put one of them into chat gpt not even the good one to be clear like probably the worst one out of all of them but from the worst one came the best one so facts so i will share the the terrible one and the chat gpt and then after that alex if you want to share the goodreads one perfect okay so the one that we talked about was two fucked up people make games while life fucks up and you know what i feel like that sums it up pretty well (laughs) yeah i would yep i would agree with that which is why i said it in the first place but (laughs) um chat gpt knows us better and came up with this gem in the midst of life's relentless chaos two profoundly flawed individuals find solace and expression through their creation of intricate games yeah i feel like you know that's what ai is for baby just <laughs> just make what was shitty and turn it into something better you know it's yeah. just not that you're saying what's shitty to the <laughs> no it was we though. can't we can't have that <laughs> Just the synopsis. <laughs> Although I do feel like it sums it up extremely well. So this one is from Goodreads. And Goodreads says, In this exhilarating novel, two friends, often in love but never lovers, come together as creative partners in the world of video game design where success brings them fame, joy, tragedy, duplicity, and ultimately a kind of immortality. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Took my thoughts on away. that yeah <laughs> like let's let's dive into that i mean that's a lot of that's a lot of heavy themes there but i mean like it is interesting that this is what they chose to put on as the goodreads sentence yeah and i guess we'll dive into this a little bit more when we get to our thoughts but you know right off the bat i mean that's heavy well, and also the part of them like always being in love but never lovers like that was something that i felt grew like Mm. I I don't to be honest with you I didn't know anything about this book I just knew it was like the best book so I you know we decided on it and I picked it up I didn't read the cover or anything yeah so I was like I had no idea that they were lover or in love but never lovers kind of thing or even like a like a trope of love in the story right yeah yeah Yeah. I mean the cover was visually stunning that's like why I wanted to read it um but yeah before you had mentioned I had never heard of this book except for like goodreads of course yeah so um why don't you give us the official book summary cool all right 
On a bitter cold day in the December of his junior year at Harvard, Sam Mazur exits a subway car and sees, amid the hordes of people waiting on the platform, Sadie Green. He calls her name. For a moment, she pretends that she hasn't heard him, but then she turns and a game begins, a legendary collaboration that will launch them to stardom. These friends, intimate since childhood, borrow money, beg favors, and before even graduating college, they have created their first blockbuster, Ichigo. Overnight, the world is theirs. Not even 25 years old, Sam and Sadie are brilliant, successful, and rich. But these qualities won't protect them from their own creative ambitions or the betrayals of their hearts. Spanning 30 years from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Venice Beach, California, and lands in between and far beyond, Gabrielle Zevin's Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow examines the multifarious nature of identity, disability, failure, the redemptive possibilities in play, and above all, our need to connect, to be loved, and to love. I love that last part. I know. Nice job reading that, Megan. That was beautiful. And it, it sums up exactly what they yearn for in this book. Yeah. And I think, well, why don't we just go ahead and dive into our thoughts? I don't want to, like, blabber on now. But take it away, Megan. All right. Well, I do want to start by saying that it was the winner of both the Book of the Month and Goodreads Book of the Year of 2022. It has a 4.2 star rating on Goodreads, and it was released on July 5th, 2022. Um, So yeah, I'd say that's pretty excellent. I mean, coming out last year, having that readership already. um, Yeah, that's impressive. And I, so I'm a Book of the Month member, and I remember when this came out, and I read a Gabrielle Zevin book when I was in middle school. Mm -hmm. It's a YA called Elsewhere, and it's pretty much about a girl who dies. And I don't remember anything else about it other than it being, like, profound and me already knowing that my mind was too small to understand the capacity of this book. Yeah. Um, So it was... When I saw that it came out, I was like, she's a YA author. Like, I don't want to read this book. You know, it's about video games. It's over my head kind of thing. Mm. Um, but then it was book of the year. And so I got the, the you know, discount for being a buddy or something. So I got, I got it. And I am very glad that I did. I will say that. I am very glad that you suggested this book because like we had kind of briefly mentioned, like I really had no expectations for this book. Like the cover is visually stunning. Mm-hmm. I liked the title Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Um, but I had no concept of like what the story was even going to be about, like none of that. And so I was very pleasantly surprised with the read and how like in depth it went and how, um, like introspective it is. Yeah. It's like how introspective it is. Like, I don't know. I just felt like it was a very intelligent read, but it was also very like emotionally intelligent. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's, I even picked that up when I was in middle school, you know, her writing is stunning. Like it's legitimately stunning. And I was telling Shelby this earlier today. Like, I think this is one of the, probably the best book I've ever read. Yes. I don't think it's my favorite book, but it is a up there. Phenomenal. It is up there. Book. Yeah, the the word brilliant seems to be mentioned a lot in this book, mm-hmm. but I truly think that Gabrielle Zevin is a brilliant writer. Absolutely. And this book just reflects that. So what are your thoughts on all of it? Uh, this is, I mean, it's a hard book to summarize and to talk about just in like, you have to read it to know. And I think yeah. that's kind of what we wanted to do with this podcast is to have, you know, people read the books with us and mm-hmm. feel like they're involved in the conversation. Yeah. Um, so, you Absolutely. know, whenever you, you know, when you read a book and you're like, this is so good, but none of your friends have read it or yes. aren't readers. And so you suggest it to them and you're like, please read it. And then they don't. And you're like, they never do. And you're always do. disappointed because you have no one to talk to about it. Don't worry. I will read Ice Planet Barbarians. Thank <laughs> you. For those of you who are listening, AKA the three of us in this house. <laughs> IPB or Ice Planet Barbarians is a great read. I will be doing a mini-sode on it. Um, Megan's going to be a good sport and read it, but we'll get to that later. And before we jump into this, we should talk a little bit about their race. Yes. So. I agree. Because um, that is heavily, heavily emphasized. Throughout the novel. Throughout the book. And rightfully so, because it does play such a big part on all of their identities. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, first we have Sadie. She is a white Jewish girl. Um, And then we have Sam, who is half 
Korean, half American. Mm-hmm. And, and was, also Jewish. Yes. Yeah. His dad, which is not, who was not in the picture, is completely white Jewish. Yeah. And then mom was full Korean. And we see a lot of, just in general, with the mom's story, complete, like, Asian xenophobia. Yeah. Like, she was always the side character, and she was always playing the the ugly roles yeah. when, in her Broadway or Hollywood. Right. Well, Mark's too. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was a big thing. Like, the parallels right. between Anna being an actress, Mark's being an actor. Um, the fact that he specifically stated, like, uh, I am will never be Macbeth, like, I will Mm -hmm. always be this person. And when he was talking to the director, the director literally made, like, a racist comment and was like, because you're Asian, like... Yeah, and did the eye thing. And did the eye thing, which, come on, like, I know this story is set in, like, 1994 at the time, or late 90s, early 90s, whatever. But, like, be for real. I just... (sighs) To think that people were actually going about the world and doing that is just, like... It's so cringe to me now in yeah. 2023. Like, I just can't. But, like... But, yeah. There I are mean, still people who might do that today, you know? Yeah. And it's gross, and they shouldn't, but they don't think it's wrong. Just like that actor didn't. Right. Or a director. And just, like, he didn't correct the director either. Because that was just normal. Yeah. At the time. He was like, I, I could have said something, but I just let it be. Zevin makes a big point of, like, also mentioning how race impacts their feeling of like feeling within and without absolutely and it's you feel that way being a young adult but then you also feel that way being a minority Mm -hmm. like say you being a woman in stem um mark's being an asian actor in a college play and anna being an actress dong hyun and bong cha being in k-town but there were so many Korean places they made a pizza place. Mm-hmm. Like, it's always, like, I think Seven put it, like, because you were multiple things, you were also none of those things. Yeah. So their identities aren't rooted in their race necessarily. Like, although that is a part of who they are, they feel a sort of separateness in addition to the separateness that society throws in their face all the right. time. So it's just, like, like a disconnect. Yeah, and so with Marx, he is half American, half Korean, half Japanese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Grew up in Tokyo with a Korean mom and a Japanese dad. Who, his mom also faced hardship in Japan. Right. Because she was Korean. Korea and Japan have a very contentious relationship, I assume especially in the 90s. Yeah. So it's... I mean, yeah, and, and I, that specific point that you made that Zevin said, I am all of these things and none of these things, is in relation to Marx and his feelings. Because, I mean, because he's an American Korean at a Japanese school, so when he's at the Japanese school, he's not Japanese enough, and when he's at Harvard, he's not... White enough. White enough. Yeah. And... I think also, I think they've all probably said that actually throughout this book. Yeah. So it's, it, I did want to take a moment out to point that out. This book kind of, it's a third person narrative and it kind of takes place from the point of view of both Sam and Sadie throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, Starting with, you know, a tragedy that happened to both of them very young and meeting in the hospital and games being their only way of escape. Uh, Throughout their college days, you know, there is a falling out that happens and they reunite in college to, um, you know, it never explicitly said, but I assumed that they just dropped out of college and created this game. But either way, they created it. At yeah, twenty two. Which could you imagine doing anything profound at twenty two? Um, well, I'm twenty five now, so <laughs> this podcast better be damn profound. But yeah, everyone, take notes. <laughs> we're making big words. We're saying words, and we're making big words. <laughs> um, yeah, like it. I truly felt like I had lived their lives with them. Oh, absolutely. Like 
I, as I was reading, it felt like 30 years had passed. Yeah. Which I think is part of the genius in the story itself, but also in Zevin's writing. She really does put you right smack in the middle of these characters. And you feel almost at once like you are the character, but Mm -hmm. also you are seeing from an outside perspective of the character. So you're getting that really cool, like, sweet spot. Yeah. Where it's both. It's like in and out. Yeah. It's very nice. I loved it. It is very difficult to write a third person. Yeah. Like, it is not easy, especially the way that she does it so, like, beautifully, like, Mm -hmm. ties it up. It's so smooth. Yeah. It's not choppy. Yep. It's, wow. Yeah. Um, One thing that I wanted to mention is that, so, you play some video games, right? I do play some. I'm not as big of a gamer as you or my husband. (laughs) <laughs> Shelby from across the house said Tears of the Kingdom which I'm an avid Zelda lover I loved Breath of the Wild we don't need to go into that now but I wanted to mention that I had a keen interest in this book because of the games I have played and it just re- took me back to like when I was a kid and I had a Wii and my dad would play Wii yeah. with us and like I don't know there's been so many good memories surrounding games in my life that like Yes, it is definitely part escaping reality, like Mm -hmm. the characters themselves, you and state, Mm -hmm. but it is creating these like wonderful memories with Mm -hmm. your friends and family that I love about gaming. And what is really interesting is that, so I have a Switch, like a Nintendo Switch, and I got a little like sticker cover for my Switch, Kanagawa Wave. So it's like the cover of the book. Oh, whoa. Yeah. And I've had it since like 2018. And I mean, it's not the exact wave, but it's, um, it's like a pink sunset, but it's the wave. Yeah. And so I was like, wow, synchronicities. Wow. That all is around. like, yeah, very serendipitous. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm holding up my book now. Um, all of these pink tabs is when I've cried. And then all of the blue ones are like a quote that I related to. Love that. And then this like lone yellow one is a, <laughs> it's a typo I found. <laughs> 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 bacon be pointing out the time okay. I will say though for like a 400 page like dense book like I felt like the you know the, the one spacing. that you found I yeah. only found one which you know it's pretty good I usually find like multiple so yeah so let, let's hear when you cried because I definitely cried in this book okay so the first one is on page 24 of the hardback version but it's essentially So Sam and Sadie have this falling out because Sadie is being his friend Mm -hmm. because of community service. Yeah, like she's dishing out charity. Yes. Right. And that's how he views it. And I think I would too. Well, yeah, absolutely. Especially when you're 12 and your mother, who is your best friend, just died and your entire foot is gone forever, essentially. Yeah. And what I really liked about this specifically was their friendship amounted to 609 hours plus the four yes. hours of the first day. Yes. This is another synchronicity that I clocked because not only did Sadie count the physical number mm-hmm. of hours of their friendship, but later in the book, Sam does that with Marks. In the days, yes. In the days, you're that, right. Yes, in the days that they had been friends, and mm-hmm. he was comparing it to like normal things in the life, like this is the way of a teen elephant, things like that. So I love that that sticks throughout the book. But yeah, I think it's just because when you think of like friendships and relationships, like normally people aren't like f- counting down the days or the numbers or the yeah. hours of that, but like with such a mathematical centered mind it makes sense that they would view it that way well and also it's like he's saying you spent 609 hours of not being my friend of lying to me yeah yeah or fake being fake and then later in the book i'm pretty sure marx is the one that says well no one spends 609 hours on something that they don't love yeah and so it it's it is a theme of you know counting these times, days, hours, however you, you know, choose to view it and and throughout these pages. But it's, I don't know. That was the first little like trickle of a tear I got. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. every everyone who's been thirteen has felt betrayed. Oh yeah, absolutely. Everything is so intense at that age. Yeah. Like 
you're really just learning about like your emotions, like yeah. how to navigate interpersonal relationships. Yeah. It makes sense that Sadie and Sam had a falling out because of this. And the thing is, Sadie even knew herself that like if she had just been straight up with Sam, it would have been fine. Well, and when you look back at Sam's life, he has only ever known loss. Yeah. Like he doesn't really have a dad. He loses his mom very young. Then he loses Marks, and it's, you know, and he loses Sadie in and out intermittently. So, yeah, I mean, I understand it. He thinks he's the problem. Yeah. And I will say, like, I think I wrote in my notes for this that, like, immediately I did not like Sadie. You did not like Sadie? I didn't like Sadie at all, and I still don't. Let's talk about that. (laughs) Sam is, well, and it's because of her betrayals multiple yeah. to Sam and yeah. Sam is my character the one yeah. that I related to the most right so I couldn't I couldn't side with her because all I could feel was the heartbreak that Sam felt yeah I mean I think that's really valid I definitely don't feel as strongly against Sadie but there were definite times that I found it really hard to root for her character absolutely um and I also found it hard to root for Sam's character at times Less. So, <laughs> less, less so. For me, at least, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, Zevin wrote a very complicated book, and with a very complicated book comes complicated characters, and this just reflects real-life problems and situations, like, and I think that goes back to, like, why it feels so realistic and, like, you're living your life with these characters is because of those qualities that they have. Yeah, like, she doesn't write, and I think it goes into, like, I mean, she, she said it in the book, is your characters are flawed too. Yeah. Like you can't create a perfect character. And at the very end, you know, Sadie was talking about how her and Sam obsessed over making like a perfect world. And you can't because a perfect world doesn't exist. Right. If there was a perfect world, then you wouldn't create a game because there'd be no point of it. Right. So I, it's so layered and how she does it. I think it's so compelling to read it. It, I mean, beautiful, beautiful work. Onward. Okay, the next time I cried is not as profound, and we can we can do a little... No, but I mean, if you cried, you cried. Like, this book is emotional as shit, so... Well, so I did... Pr- I, I tacked it in pink any time a tear came to Just my eye. Just a eyes. single tear. <laughs> like, if it rolled down my cheek, I put a mark. Okay. So... That's very specific. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I don't typically cry, so it was yeah. interesting to... Or I don't cry during books often. Right. Well, I don't know if that's true, but I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, so I was just tabbing when I did. And then like towards the end, I was just like sobbing for pages <laughs> and I was like, maybe I should take out those other ones. But <sighs> I the end was so rough, but yeah, we'll get there. Um, the next one was when we were talking about we see, she, she made me think that I'm part of this novel. Yeah. See, uh, we are the characters. Um, when Sam and Dong Hyun are talking about him going to Sadie's bat mitzvah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And they, page? Sh- give me the page. Sorry, 52 page. and 53. Okay. And this is also when they're talking about Emily Blaster. Oh, it's kind of like yeah. going in between. So I have these in, in the middle of 52. He says, I don't want to go. Please don't make me go. And Dong Hyun's like, why? Sam says, I don't know, because he felt embarrassed saying that his only friend hadn't been his friend at all. Mm. And when you're that age and you've experienced the loss that he has, like, can you not just, you can't express your feelings, but you feel them so vividly. Yep. You know, you are so, like, embalmed in rage, but you can't express that. The world is very black and white at that age. Yeah. Like, when you feel that you know a truth at that age, you're like, this is it. There's, it is either this or nothing. Right. And so, I relate to Sam in this part because, like, I would be, frankly, petty. He's being a little little petty. Um, I would be just as petty and relentless in my feelings at this point because, you know... (sighs) Sadie's friendship mattered so much to Sam. That's the that's the biggest part here. Um, 
because of how it was set up, their meeting, like, he was in the hospital. He had just lost his mother. There's this random girl who comes in to play games that he loves. And she is literally the first person he talks to. So the fact that there is this betrayal, you know, it his reaction is valid. Like, it is devastating for Sam. Like, this is the first... Like, imagine being that age, literally moving physically across the country. Yeah. Because a woman committed suicide. In front of your face. In front of your face. And one of the first things you do is go into the drugstore and play a video game. Yeah. And then you move across the country, completely new environment, and then your mother dies. And so you turn to games. Yeah. And there is someone that comes along that shares that love for you, that need to escape with you. And the first thing she does is betray him. Like, that yeah. is incredibly heartbreaking. It's so upsetting. It is so upsetting. And I feel like we're, for people who haven't read this book, to kind of clarify a few points. Um, so there was definitely some spoilers in there, what we just talked oh, about. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But... Um, there's so Sam doesn't speak for six weeks after the the car accident and Sadie is the first person he talks to and I'm pretty sure his first words to her were do you want to play or like do you want to turn yes and it, it you know it's just because she was watching him and I used to watch my brother playing video games growing up so it was I always enjoyed watching and I think there's kind of a debate throughout this on that topic, but Sadie was content to just watch. And, you know, she she did love playing games, but she also was fine just watching, especially when someone's so much better at it than you. And I did I did even flag, you know, the Mario secret. I didn't I never knew how to get to the top of the flagpole. <laughs> Always bothered me. <laughs> No, the flagpole was a struggle for everyone. Um, No, but what you're saying about play, like, one of the first things I jotted down in my notes was how Sam and Sadie viewed play as an intimate thing, like, almost more intimate than sex. And I totally agree. Yeah. Um, Because sex can be very generic. It can be. It can be impersonal. It can be so impersonal. It can be so impersonal to the point that people who have trouble finding that intimacy, like, will just kind of accept whatever. Mm-hmm. And, but play, on the other hand, like, as they say in the in the book, it really does take trust with your partner. And, like, the fact that Sam, because I know he was aware of Sadie's presence at first. Like, it's not like he was completely unaware or oblivious to the fact that she was watching him. But it also pointed to the fact that at that point Sam already trusted Sadie Mm -hmm. because like you know if he's turning to games as like a way to escape his reality then allowing someone to watch you like that is your most intimate space and like you know when I think about like like you like watching my siblings play games or whatever Mm -hmm. a lot of times I'd be like okay my turn like you know get off like I want to play like I want to be first player or whatever but Sadie being the person that she was Like, just, as you say, just watched. And she was content with that. And that already built such a foundation of trust within their friendship. That's a great observation. I didn't think about it in that context of, like, he already trusted her. Yeah. Cry Sadie. Cries again. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And and then another thing I did want to point out um, for anyone who is just listening, um, to listen to our voices is that Sadie was in the hospital because her sister Alice had cancer. Mm-hmm. And so her and her sister get in a fight and she doesn't know where to go in the hospital. She's, you know, 13 too. So she's just wandering around and one of the nurses says, Oh, there's video games over there. And that's how they encounter each other. And once the nurse sees that they were talking, she pulls them aside and says, hey, will you continue to do this every day because he hasn't talked to anyone? And so it, and it, it counts towards community service for her bat mitzvah. 
So that's where this kind of secrecy comes in. And like Alex said earlier, like she knew and Frida, her grandmother pointed it out. And Alice was eventually the one who told Sam. It wasn't even, Mm -hmm. it wasn't even Sadie that had the balls to say anything. Yeah. And honestly, she probably never would have. No. But because why would she at that point? So, yeah. Next cry part. <laughs> um, We're going to page 241. And this is... Oof. oof. <laughs> it's always a big oof in uh, this book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and even the way Zevin, like... Um, breaks up the chapters oh my god in the sections like the titles holy shit like uh we'll go so into that talented. later but mm, beautiful but anyway so we skip a bunch essentially what happens is sam goes to harvard sadie goes to mit and they don't talk again until sam sees her in the bus station or train station and Sam is like, I shouldn't say anything. And then he says, fuck it, I'm going to say something. And Sadie pretends to not hear him. They end up seeing each other. And they can't resist the game. So she gives him a USB or whatever they're called at the time. Because this is like the 80s or 90s. Yeah. And um, gives him the game to play. So at this point... They're both doing computer science shit, and ultimately they decide to create a game together. Sadie had to for her class, which, long story short, she was banging the professor, and... (laughs) I mean, that's what she was doing. Yeah. And I mean, let's quickly talk about that relationship. Okay. Now that you brought it up. Um, Yeah, problematic as fuck. He's, what in his late 20s at this point and she's literally 19 it's literally the tale as old as time like an abuse of power he really well and not just like an abuse of power but abusive emotionally and physically yeah like literally abusive like she was abused and the fact what astounded me and I think this just goes to show Sam and Sadie's relationship is that she still kept talking to Dov. Yeah. I think that speaks a lot to Sadie because even in the end of the book when she's in her mid-30s, she even, or Zevin makes a point to state that Sadie blushes at his compliments. Yes! And it's like, girl, homegirl. And I can't... She's more successful than him. Yeah, exactly. And like, I relate to Sadie in that way. And I feel like a lot of girls can because, like, when you, when a guy runs through you like that, like, it is so hard to separate your identity from the identity you had when you were with him. Yeah. And you will forever be kind of tied to that person in that way. Even though, logically, you know that, like, this person is bad for me or whatever. Um, So I definitely relate to Sadie in that. But, yeah, fuck Dov. He... So stupid. I knew the moment that they were going to get together is when he was doing the seminar at MIT and he was like, Miss Sadie Green or whatever, like called her name when he didn't care to know any of his other students. Yeah, Yeah, which is pretentious as fuck. I mean, I know it's MIT, but like, come on. Like, when he called her, I was like, fuck off. I know. I was like, I already see where this is going. I know. I already see where this is going. I am not. And just the fact that she was so elated with like his compliments, I was like, girl, get a grip. Stand up. But to to her credit is she she was a girl and a man. Literal child. Well, Well, not child. (laughs) Well, she was 19 to be clear. It's not that crazy. My my issue is that she's a girl in a man's dominated industry. There was no way for her. Yeah. And without that relationship, she wouldn't have been able to go to him to get each of them off the ground. Yeah. And it's just really unfortunate, and I'm glad that Zebin does spend the time to talk about the male-dominated industry, mm-hmm. because although this is 2023, there are remnants of that still in today's Absolutely. society. And so people, and women specifically, can read this book and find something to relate to in that sense. Now, back in 1994 or the late 90s, when um, before Sam had even re-encountered Sadie, like, it's just... 
it just felt so real to me and so prevalent. The fact that Zevin painted Sadie's success story as starting this way. Like, I think Mm -hmm. it was a very specific choice. Mm -hmm. I think it speaks a lot to Sadie's character. I think it speaks a lot to Sadie's inner monologue at the time. And she even states at the end of the book, like, I was literally this whirling dervish of, like, insecurity and, like, selfishness. And it's it's facts. Like, that is what she was. Yeah, she was... I mean, she was a 19-year-old girl, like, trying... To prove herself, she's trying to not just be that woman statistic at the MIT class. She was trying to say, I can do this and I was chosen because I'm good at it, not mm-hmm. because I'm a woman. Mm-hmm. But then that comes with, you have to be better. Yeah. You know, anything you produce, it's just going to be bad it's unless gonna be it's subpar. better. And unless you were a man. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just... It, my heart goes out to all the women at that time period because... Just in general. Just in general, honestly, not even now and then. Like, it's just... The society is a society. It is. And I think, I mean, you said there was a choice that she made. I think everything about this book was a choice. It comes down to choices. And Zevin did a great job of being so particular Mm -hmm. on how this story was thought through and developed and what details she included Mm -hmm. and we'll get to it when marx is in the coma i have a lot of thoughts on that the coma no but what you just said like everything the choices and the way zevin crafts this book it's insane because that is what game engineering is yeah that is what gameplay is. It's a series of choices. And it's a series of choices that the characters in this book also play out in their own lives. Yeah. I mean, Sam is obviously not the hero. Sadie is not the heroine. But essentially, they are playing the game of their lives. Yeah. And it really does come down to choices. Like, mm-hmm. what if Sam had decided to never yell at Sadie at the subway? Right. What if Sadie had never dated Marks? Like, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I, that also goes back to the title, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. It's mentioned, of course, in the Shakespeare poem excerpt, but it also is mentioned in the context of gameplay. Absolutely. You have a tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow always waiting. Like, it is an infinite life that you are living. And so it's just interesting to think about. I actually think I tabbed that that exact quote of saying, you have infinite tomorrows. Yes. And I, like, I was just like, This is amazing. (laughs) Well, and I used to, I think this was just me being an existential child, but I would stay awake at night thinking about what happens when I get the game over screen. Yeah. Like, how do you comprehend that as a kid? Yeah. And I just, I mean, I remember being 10 and being like, do I just press okay and it starts over again? Like, that can't possibly be how actual life is. And it's not. Right. That's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. But so to get back to this, this, this next pink tab of me crying. Yes. Marx is, we've talked a lot about him. He is Sam's roommate. Oh, I, yeah. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a lot of feelings oh, about Marx. Marx. And he is a very wealthy, but very kind soul Mm -hmm. who just sees Sam as someone like he just wants to take him under his wing and protect him and it's it's really a beautiful relationship that they craft until until there's always an until yeah Sadie comes in so Sadie and Sam decide to work on a game together but Sam doesn't want Sadie and Marks to meet. And I think it's yeah. because he knows yeah. ultimately they're perfect <sighs> yeah. together. And Sadie doesn't want to meet Marks either. Well, she doesn't like Marks at first. No. She, she dislikes Marks. She wants to be Sam's partner. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't want help from this third party mm-hmm. who's just giving them money, essentially. But as we go through the story, of course, Sadie and Marks start dating and Sam knows almost immediately and they continue to not tell him 
Mm-hmm. And Marx really doesn't want to. Mm-hmm. And Which says a lot about Marx as well. I was actually surprised about that. Yes, because I think Zevin does that intentionally. I, again, everything's a choice. Everything's a choice. She sets up Marx as this incorruptible character. Yep. And the fact of the matter is, no one, NPC alike or not... Stop. I know! <laughs> <laughs> We'll get there. Um, is perfect, even in the game. Yeah. And so it's just unfortunate that we are set up to believe that he is this, like, incorruptible character. But he does die, like, a hero's death. Like, he he is, in fact, corruptible. He is, in fact, mortal. Well, and his fatal flaw is small. Compared to Sadie and Sam. Absolutely. So I understand to an extent why he wouldn't want to tell his closest friend. But at the same time, does he not know why Sam and Sadie stopped talking in the first place? Yeah. It, I think Sam said it this way as well, but he said it was like either the audacity or like the pretension. Like, yeah. How dare you be so pretentious to think like I would not pick up on this. Right. Like, or, like, to be mad about it. Yeah, or to be, like, enraged by it, which he was, but... Well, he was enraged because they didn't tell him. Right. And... Well... So, that's actually the part that I tabbed. Yeah, okay, let's get, <laughs> let's get there. So, Mark's, Sadie, and Sam's company is called Unfair Games. Mm-hmm. And they're having a toast to something. Mm-hmm. I think a release of a game. Mm-hmm. And... Marx and Sadie walk out to get something and Sam does the celebration without them there. Right. And he's upset by this because they're a team. Right. This is all of their hard work and he wants them to be there for it. And when he walks out to go find them, they're on the stairs. Mm-hmm. And... And he spots them. And he sees them. And the yeah. way that Sadie is looking at Marks mm-hmm. immediately, Sam knows that they're in love. Yeah. And then proceeds to not tell them, tell him for a year. Yeah. Like he is, sits on that for a year. He doesn't bring it up and they don't bring it up. I want to read this part. Yeah. It says, she had said that Sam didn't know her and she being Sadie. Um, but he knew her well enough to know what her face looked like when she was in love. Her eyes were softer and her expression was less arch and self-conscious. Her hand entitled as if she owned Marx's cheek. Her posture slightly canted toward him, relaxed and pliable. Her cheeks flushed. She knew pretty, or she was pretty all the time, but she was beautiful in love. He knew her well enough to know it must have been going on for some time. Like, damn. Like, that... Like, just... The Your wh- two closest friends. You are to know somebody on that level. Yeah. Like, there's another part in the book where Sam says, like, how can she think I don't know her when I can literally trace her hand from memory front to back? Yeah. Like... I know her calluses. Yes. Like, that is the most intimate, precise form of, like knowing another person yeah and like it made me so mad at sadie and marks for not telling him because it is fucking pretentious to be like our closest friend who we have known in sadie and sam's case throughout their entire lives but in mark's case for the better part of their lives to not pick up on those cues and to not know that it's shitty yeah And what really got me was, he says, how do I go on when the person I love most in the world is in love with someone else? Someone tell me the solution so I don't have to play this losing game all the way through. Oh my god. The solution, the choices, the fact that Sadie's name, or Sadie named her game Solution, full circle. And he, I mean, he knows just by looking at them in this one intimate moment they're going to get married. Yeah. They're going to be together. Yes. He sees it happen in an instant. And isn't that so factual? Like that when you... Gives me chills. Yes. 
Like, I have ex- not at this exact situation, but it's like when you see a moment like that, you do kind of picture this like scenario, like yeah. this tale that will happen. Like, you played out in your mind. And I relate to that so much. And like, and it is factual. Like, he knows them well enough to where it's not just a fantasy he's creating. Like, it would be pretty damn close to reality. When you're that connected with people, you can play that out in your mind. Yeah. And it's just, it was so heartbreaking for Sam. I mean, even like, I don't know. And this is what makes it so pretentious too, because let's say that Sam and Sadie and Marks were not as intimately connected as they were friendship wise or other. Like, even if you're hanging out with like semi acquaintances or semi strangers, if someone is touching each other intimately like that, it's pretty damn clear what's going on. Yeah. When Sadie and Marks kissed, I literally had to put the book down. I could not pick it up. And admittedly, I was reading this book like partly physically and then partly like audibly. Audibly? I was listening to the book. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it just took me like a second to get my head around the fact that I saw it was coming. We knew it was coming a mile away and it happened and... I was not ready for the emotional fallout to come after that. So you had texted me, like, I stopped reading for two days, and I was like, fuck. So I honestly expected it to be a lot worse. Okay. But then we get to the NPC chapter. (laughs) Yeah, the NPC chapter. But before we get to the NPC chapter, I have one tab, and it is not a cry tab. It's just a tabby tab of something that I marked. Um, And I think it kind of leads us into the NPC chapter well. And freaking Gabrielle Zevin, Mm -hmm. she's out here naming these sections so well. How dare she? And you, you see it. It's in the table of contents. You see marriages and you absolutely know. Oh, you know. You know. But how dare she? But that's the question. <sighs> you know, it's not Sam asking Sadie and Marks who has audacity. It's we need to be asking Gabrielle Ze- Zevin her audacity to be naming these parts. Her audacity in general to create such like a poignant. Yes. Like, it's so pointed. Yeah. Like it, it, it feels like a very pointed book to me. <laughs> yeah. Let me actually read the sections really quick because I did not do that before so first part is sick kids second part is influences third part is unfair games fourth part is both sides fifth part is pivots sixth part is marriages seventh part is the npc not just nbc the npc eighth part is our infinite days like what the hell is that and then uh, what is that nine is pioneers and ten is freights and grooves which now that I'm reading that oh you didn't get that one no now that I'm reading that there's a poem that Gabrielle Zevin leaves in the beginning of the book and And it's also used Sadie uses it in her game Mm -hmm. yeah and because Marx and Sam discuss like well what are the frights and the grooves or whatever but anyway the poem goes that love is all there is is all we know of love it is enough the freight should be proportioned to the groove And that's what Sam is thinking when he breaks his ankle, which is what ultimately causes them to move to California. Oh my God. Because he's happy and he, uh, uh, so uh, God damn this book. I know. Uh, (laughs) So then we get to the dreaded, the NPC chapter. The NPC. See. Which I didn't I didn't put one pink tab in here because I think I just cried. The whole the thing. You just saw through the whole thing. Y'all can't see me, but I'm covering my face with the book right now and <laughs> shrinking away. But um yeah, I mean, what a part. What like the poetry of it, the symbolism of it, you know. And so we get to the NPC chapter and We've come along this journey with, of course, Sam and Sadie, but now, like, we're at the epitome of, like, how Sadie and Marx's relationship has impacted 
Sam and Sadie's friendship Mm -hmm. and life together and work together. And it's just wild that, like, (laughs) Seven decided to throw this little tidbit in. But, you know, that's part of a beautiful story. Like, you just... You fall in love with these characters and something terrible and horrible and something that resembles reality is thrown in. And it's just, it's beautiful and terrible and heart-wrenching and that's what this this part is. And I think the, in, in a video game, there's always that like side character and you get like that cutscene. Yeah. Of like your favorite side character. Yeah. And you learn about their past real quick. Yep. And you get attached. That's what this is. Yeah. It's seeing his, like, montage of a life. Yep. And these chapters, and it's... Whew. It's a lot. For those of you that don't know, NPC stands for non-player character. So when you are playing, especially, like, RPGs, like a role-playing game, um, you're obviously playing as the main character that comes across different characters in the games. Um that you yourself are not controlling or playing. Like, these are other characters in the story, such as, like, the villain or even the local shopkeeper, people like that, that you interact with, um, but you are not physically playing. So think about that meaning and how it applies in this part. I know. (sighs) Okay. I want to talk about it. I want to avoid it, but I want to talk about it. There's so much to talk about. Go for it. All right. So... And this is another part that I love about this book is that you'll go from intense scenes and dialogues between the characters to like something completely different. So we start this part in Marx's mind as he's dying. And it's just so sad to think about because to think about how so they create this game called Maple World. And in Maple World, and obviously this is like the early 2000s, and in Maple World, they decided that it was a great idea for everyone to be able to get married. Like, no matter who you were, what gender you were, or anything like that. So, because these are literally pixels on the screen, you know, like... Right. Well, and also they're two other uh, designers are gay. And they went to San Francisco in the early 2000s when they allowed people to have same-sex marriage there and it was revoked like the next day. Immediately. Yeah. So Sam was like, fuck it. We're gonna make it legal in the game. And um, that was just kind of like their statement to the world like this is what we stand for at Unfair Games. Mm -hmm. This is what we believe in type of thing. Well obviously in the story that caused some backlash from society um unfair games started receiving a lot of hate mail a lot of like sam you can kill yourself messages you know type of thing and we come to a part in the story where tensions are still high between sam and sadie but they go on a tour to new york to do like a press shoot essentially And during that time, they've kind of bonded. They're not really discussing the past and, like, all of the emotions that are dredged up with that. And so they're genuinely having a good time, what it seems like. And as we know, when two characters who've had a tumultuous past have a good time, something bad is about to happen. So Yeah, cute mini tears. So Sam's publicist gets a text that there has been a shooting in the tech area of Los Angeles where their office building is. Now, the way she phrases it, Sam thinks like, oh, well, we're not in tech, we're in gaming, so that's terrible, but it's probably not us. Um, And when they're done with the photo shoot, he looks at his phone and it's like, oh, I have 15 missed calls from Marks. Well, we already kind of can decipher what has happened. Um, Someone, two people actually, who were upset with the Maple World expansion of marriages, wanted to hunt down Mazer or Sam and shoot him, kill him. So these people show up at Unfair Games and it's two guys, like younger guys. They've worn like matching bandanas and they're holding a gun to the downstairs secretary. Um, 
and Marx is there on site. And Marx, being the person that he is, of course, feels like he can de-escalate the situation. Um, he truly feels, he tells Ant to take everyone up to the roof. And he tells Ant, like, I really just think that they need someone to talk to. Like, I can get it. Meanwhile, Sam and Sadie are literally in New York. Yeah. And Ant is one of the gay producers. Yes. Yes. And, um... He's more than that, but for clarity. Yeah, like, just (laughs) where we're at in the story. And uh, so, Ant takes everyone upstairs while Marx goes downstairs and tries to de-escalate with these guys. So, and he's basically like, what are y'all doing here? Can I help you with something? Like, being... Marx being Marx. And obviously that's never how the story ends. And Marx even makes it a point as he's like talking to these people, like thinking in his head, like um, people who play video games, like sometimes feel like in the real world, like they want to become the hero, like they want to become. And he realizes like that these are gamers as well. And they have put that role upon themselves. And like, this is how they're dishing out justice, essentially. Well, and he was asking them, like, what games do you play? Yeah. To stall. Yeah. And obviously that did not work. No. No. Um, yes. Marx eventually gets shot, what, four times? So he he shoots five times, one hits Ant, three hit Marx. One hits the wall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Marx is bleeding out on the unfair games floor, and Sadie and Sam are still in New York. Mm-hmm. We are shifted to Marx's point of view in the hospital mm-hmm. under a coma. And uh, it's just, <laughs> it's so terrible, but so brilliant that she wrote it this way because Marx is obviously not conscious, but he's not unconscious to the point where he can't hear what's going on around him. So he knows that his family have come to visit him. His mother starts folding the thousand cranes, which in some Asian cultures means like you're trying to get a person healthy again. It's just good fortune. Um, And Sam comes once... Watanabe leaves. Sam comes and helps Marx's mother continue folding the cranes. And, you know, at this point, we know that Sadie's pregnant. And Mm -hmm. we forgot to talk about that. We forgot to talk about that. But she's pregnant and Marx knows. Marx is Which I actually didn't know that. Until the the coma. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what are your thoughts on the pregnancy? Like, so what I was actually surprised about was that she had an abortion, which yeah. caused her first... Uh, she had an abortion with Doe's baby, mm-hmm. and that was what caused her depression in college. And it was said that it was just his, like, a breakup. Yeah. And that's why she couldn't get out of bed, but we later learned that it was because of an abortion. And... So it must be very triggering to get pregnant again. Yep. And then to lose the father in such a traumatic way. Yeah. Cannot be very healthy for the mother. No, absolutely not. I mean, things were already tense for Sadie. Not in necessarily her and Marx's relationship, but just her life in general. I mean, work was stressful. Um, things between her and Sam were obviously not great. And then, like you say, like, the past that she's lived through, um, it just, I can't imagine, like, having gone through that loss and then finally being in love with someone, moving into a house with someone, finally readying yourself to have a baby with someone when you don't find those necessarily, like, institutional ideas to be like normal or something that you want for yourself and to finally get to that place and then just to lose it yeah and one thing about them moving into that house together 
Um, they had that persimmon tree in the backyard. Yes. Uh, and, there's a big fruit theme. Yeah. And, which is interesting, because I wonder if that's, like, getting fruit throughout, like, a game. Mm-hmm. And, and gain like, gaining health or whatever. Interesting. But he he's like, oh, my God, persimmons are my favorite fruit. Mm-hmm. And Sadie goes... I don't know if I've ever heard him talk about a persimmon before. Like, is he deciding that persimmon but, is his favorite fruit now, or has it always been his favorite fruit? Right. Yeah. And and her whole point of that is that he isn't lucky. He creates luck. Yeah. Like, he makes the outlook. That's just who he is. Yeah. Fundamentally. Yeah. So instead of saying, oh, well, last week I liked apples, but now I like persimmons. He's just like, no, I just always love persimmons. It's just a very interesting, I think, goes to his character very well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why he's so optimistic that things will work out during mm-hmm. the shooting. Because things always work out for Mars. Yeah. That's just how life is for him. hmm And unfortunately, that is not how it works out. And uh, the inner monologue that he has in the hospital... So, yeah, there's a part where he mentions that there is an ungenerous part of you, you being Mark's in his mind, mm-hmm. that wishes you had left Gordon in the reception area and gone up to the roof with with everyone else. Um, video games don't make people violent, but maybe they falsely give you an idea that you can be a hero. Without warning, your mind flies away again. Yeah. So basically, we're in his unconscious mind, just shifting between, like, memories and... Um, kind of this poetic scene that is literally Mark's dying. Yeah. And, and and he's saying he's essentially like an unsuccessful hero because he died. Yeah. And there's like little, little sentences italicized. So it's like, mm-hmm. you are still alive. You are still alive. Still alive. You are going to die. <laughs> And then it it shifts to, like, the explanation of that. It says, some hours, days, or weeks later, you were listening to a doctor tell your mother and father in an outrageously serene voice that you, Mark Watanabe, citizen of the world, are going to die. And that is the uncorruptible character, the NPC, being removed from this world. Yeah. And also, uh, early, early in the book... Sadie asks Sam, or they're playing Mario together, and she said, I'll play when you die. That's their first conversation. Yes. And she goes, oh, shit, that was insensitive. Are you dying? And he says, well, we all are. That's what that made me think of. It, like, yes. tied back to that. Yes. Of we, like, you are always dying. Like, to live is to die, etc. So... Yeah, and I mean, Mark's even in this state is thinking that. Um, Yeah, okay, so he says, you are dying. No, that came out wrong. What you meant to express was the existential grief that comes with the knowledge that all things die. You are not dying except insofar as you have always been dying. Yeah. Oof. Oof, big oof. (laughs) Big oof. So, Mark's dies. Sadie has his child. One thing that was interesting to me is that he never thinks, I hope they go on without me. Yeah. I hope they're happy without me. I hope they find each other through my grief. (sighs) And that's where my, like, love for Marx dies a little. Because, I mean, of course I haven't died. I haven't gotten close to dying before so what do i know but you often see it portrayed as you know i hope i made a mark around those around me i hope the ones that i love are okay and he never mentions not even sadie or the baby he doesn't even mention the baby at all really he he mentions it like one time right yeah and of course your brain's dying so what are you to think i don't know right But he knows they love each other. Yeah. And he doesn't 
say anything about that, which Mm -hmm. I just, I thought that was so, it was a choice that Zevin made, you know? She could have been like, in my last dying thought, I hope that they live together happily ever after. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because, I think it goes back to the selfish thing. I mean, in our own way, we're all, we all can be selfish. Yeah. And even and he our, doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. And even in our dying moments, we can hold on to that. Yeah. And it's just interesting the way that she kind of mapped out Marx's last thoughts. Mm-hmm. And specifically the the last little italicized, you're in the strawberry field. Yeah. You're dead. And at the the last part of the NPC. You are flying over the strawberry field, but you know it's a trap. This time you keep flying. Like, he literally was like, this world was not made for me. Mm-hmm. Like, this was Sam and Sadie's world. Well, and it's so interesting that in the coma, he's thinking of a strawberry field. Because mm-hmm. when Sadie first meets his mother, she brings up the strawberry field Mm -hmm. textile that she loves. And so it's just really, well, and then he goes on to have that nightmare about it. Yeah. Which created Maple World, right? Yeah. 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 And I loved the last thing that he thinks about, like before he, before we are told that he is like officially dead is when he talks about him, Sadie and Sam and some of his close friends, and staff of the unfair games that they go and try these peaches. Um, and to him, it's like a perfect day. And I love that while he, like you say, like he doesn't necessarily give in his last dying thoughts, Sam and Sandy, the freedom to be together. The last thoughts that he has are of them them, together. Yeah. Like eating peaches being friends and talking about games. And that was before that Marx and Sadie ever got together. Yeah, like that e- that day was at the beginning. Well, not the beginning of the book, but beginning of California. California. Yeah. yeah. So, wow. I want to read this I want to read this paragraph. So it says So this is when Marx is officially dead. And it says, a prompt comes up on the screen. Start playing from the beginning. Yes, you think. Why not? If you play again, you might win. Suddenly you were there, brand new, feathers restored, bones unbroken, sanguine with fresh blood. You are flying more slowly than last time because you don't want to miss any of it. The cows, the lavender, the women humming Beethoven, the distant bees, the sad-faced man and the couple in the pond, the beat of your heart before you go on stage, the feel of a lace sleeve against your skin, your mother singing Beatles songs to you, trying to sound like she's from Liverpool. The first playthrough of Ichigo. The rooftop on Abbot Kinney. The taste of Sadie mixed with Hefeweizen beer. Sam's round head in your hands. A thousand paper cranes. Yellow tinted sunglasses. A perfect peach. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> Deep breaths. Deep breaths all around. (laughs) And then the next part is fucking titled Our Infinite Days. Which is also one of his last thoughts was about the game Our Infinite Days. Because while he was going downstairs to deal with the shooters, another couple was there trying to pitch their game. Mm -hmm. And he's like, this is great. I want to help them. And he Mm -hmm. says, never mind. I can't. Because I'm dying. Yeah. And it's not until months later that Sam finds it on Sadie's desk because Sadie hasn't been in, obviously, since the shooting. Mm -hmm. And um, he says, you know what? Not bad. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's funny to think that, like, Marx is literally facing an active shooter in the building and he has this couple with him, and he literally leaves their portfolio for Sadie to find. Like, tell me what you think about this. Yeah. And then it's found months later. This book, man. I know. Book. And what I'm, 
you know what? I actually don't think I did cry during the NPC chapter. No, but it was deeply moving. It was. And I, the reason why I say that is because I didn't tab it and I trust my tabs. Yeah. But what I did tab was when Naomi is born. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about that. And Sam, essentially, he he talks to Bong Cha Mm -hmm. and says, how did you do it after mom died? Mm -hmm. And this was when he was a kid. Yeah. And he says, I just talked to her. And he's like, what do you mean? There's ghosts? And he was like, no, no. Or she said, no, no, no. I just talked to her because I know her. Yeah. And so... Sam starts talking to Marx because he knows Marx has always led him in the right direction. Yeah. So he becomes this guiding thought. And he t- generally follows it, but he doesn't. His imaginary Marx says, you should go meet this baby. Trust me on this. And he didn't. Yeah. And... He says, still he did what he could for Sadie. He went to work even when he didn't want to, even when he was in pain. He called Alice, whom he disliked, to see how Sadie was. He drove past her house to make sure her lights were on, but he kept his distance because that was what she asked for. Maybe it wasn't enough, but it was what he could do. And that breaks me every time. Yeah, it... I feel like throughout this book, Sadie and Sam have done this dance of, like... Absolutely. ...caring so much about each other and yet not wanting that to be known by the other person. And Sam is unconventional in every single way, like, showing his love for Sadie. And I think that's another tragedy of this book is because if Sam would just, frankly, get over himself... I would argue that Sadie needs to do the damn same. <laughs> in the, in yeah. Obvi- obviously not in this instance. But there have been so many times, both of them, like, have too high self-esteems of themselves. Yeah. To be able to, like... Or such low self-esteem at times. Like, it's almost like they have this fluctuating God complex. Well, they just want to look good in front of the other. Yeah. And so they can't fucking ask for help. Yeah. Like, straight up, anytime, like, Sam's like, I can't tell anyone I'm in pain. Your fucking foot's missing, man. You're allowed to be in a little bit of pain. Well, and I don't think he's doing that because he necessarily wants to look good in front of Sadie. I think he's doing that mainly because he has been so damaged in his life he can't stand the thought of other people continuously seeing him as a damaged being. Which is, uh, we could go on and on about the concept of disability in this book. Yeah. Because it's there. He doesn't consider himself disabled until long after yeah. the amputation of his foot. Yeah. Which. And then he kind of uh, embraces it. Yeah. Yeah. But only after he's become like an icon. Right. Or a form of strength, like yeah. Anyway, they both just needed to get over themselves. They bo- everyone needed to go to therapy, and it could have been a little everyone bit needed better. help. Yeah, or just yeah, helped each other, or communicate or a just little bit. Talk. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Like I don't know, and then there's the whole complex of being like the smartest kid in the room. But they went to Harvard and MIT. You I can't know. be. You just can't be. I know. Yeah, and I. But I think like growing up. Even themselves, like, seeing each other at, like, competitions and stuff. And Sadie had many complexes. As did Sam. As did Sam. What did you think of the Pioneers chapter? I knew what it was. It took me a minute to figure out what the hell was going on. Really? Well, I was confused by it. Okay, I was confused at first as well. Because I didn't... And I still don't really understand how it was working. Like, how did... I understand that he created the world for her, Mm -hmm. but was all of it just, like, was it public? Is that what you're asking? No, no, no. Um, so all of it was Sadie choosing, right, things? Because how I understood it was that it was, like, a film, almost, that he provided to her. And then I was like, no, that's not right. No. But then I got confused on how it was working. So she she selected everything. Yep. 
Yeah. I mean, technically, Sam did find her via her IP address as an in-player character. So he did seek her out. But it was Sadie or Emily, like, making the decisions that led her to Daedalus. How the fuck did she not know? Oh, she knew. Oh, she knew. She... I think she even says, like, she tried to fool herself into not knowing. But you can't. Like, how could you fool yourself into... Yeah. The thing is, like, this game, for her, was a reprieve for everything that was going on. That is true. And so, when you're into something like that, when you need to be out of your life, out of your body, you will hold on to that comfort, no matter what truth may lay behind it. Yeah. You know? And so, while it was obvious to all of us... What was going on? Sadie has the ability to fool herself into thinking that no. But, like, even when she sees Daedalus's character, which I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, it but is. okay, cool. Um, she says, like, I could draw you in circles, talking back to when she first met Sam. Mm-hmm. So, it's, yeah. So, when she asked, because in the game, Emily, a.k.a. Sadie, and Dr. Daedalus, a.k.a. Sam, has a kid named Ludo Quintus. And Ludo means game in Latin, and Quintus means fifth game. So that's when Sadie finds out that Daedalus is Sam. And essentially that Sam has created this entire... Finds out. No. Yeah. <laughs> except Eyes roll? I don't know. Accepts... No, finds out, takes a fat pill. I don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, she was like, and it, she even says here, Emily was reasonably certain she already knew. Yeah, facts. She already knew. So she did, but she, if she was so pissed about it, why'd she let it keep going? Because innately, and I think this is like, speaks to their relationship at whole. Sadie knows that while their relationship is tumultuous, and Sam knows this too, while there is tension, while there is conflict, there is no one that they can rely on like each other. There is no one that they can talk to like each other. And this game that Sam literally created for Sadie, he wasn't doing this for money. He wasn't doing this because it was like a great idea or whatever. He literally created a game that was like Oregon Trail because that was a game she loved as a kid. Right. And he knew that he could approach her in a virtual setting when, in reality, him trying to approach her was not going to work. And so, he created this master fucking plan to basically help her when she was dealing with postpartum depression and literally could not go back to the office, could not do her job. Not saying that she should have, like, she needed a friend, and that was what Dr. Daedalus provided. Right. And so I think that's why it was so easy to fool herself, because she, while she was fooling herself, she didn't have to face the fact that IRL Sam and her had issues. Her and virtual Sam could just be Sadie and Sam. Yeah. You know what I didn't like about Sadie is the fact that she left her virtual child to swim. <laughs> and, so I, <laughs> and she goes, don't worry, my love. You aren't real, so you can't... <laughs> that was really funny. I like Sadie. I was actually like, all right, all right, I kind of like her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, damn, that is... That I, is existential as fuck. Okay. <laughs> I liked how she, she died of dysentery. Yeah, because that was a note to Sam. That was an Easter egg for Sam. She's trying. I she feel like, like she needs help so bad and she knows it. Yeah. But she can't say it. And and when Sam does reach out, she says, go away. Yeah. But obviously no one means that when they say that. But she knows Sam can't go. Yeah. So we're at the end. I have two more, two more pink tabs. Okay, correct. Let's talk about it. Let's get it. So Grandpa's dying, mm-hmm. and he says, 
when you talk to Sadie, tell her there's pizza for her. Friends of Sam's eat free. <gasps> and what I immediately picked up is when you talk to Sadie. Yep. He didn't say... Because it's definite. Right. And what you later find out in, like, two pages is that he's giving Sadie the Donkey Kong arcade machine that they played growing up. And so he already knows. What we don't know as the reader is that he's already set them up that they have to talk. Thus, it feels like he's he's saying you're going to talk regardless. Like, even if I don't give her this Donkey Kong thing that I'm about to give her, you will still be in communication. Which I thought was very lovely, and it made me cry. Mm-hmm. To be clear, also, I finished reading it today, and I think Alex did too. Yeah, I did. So it feels a lot like like of a fresher wound. Yeah. Than I think it normally it's sore. would. Yeah. So you know, rehashing it feels like poking a, a bruise, mm-hmm. almost like my heart bruise. <laughs> And we'll go back, I think we mentioned this uh, probably like an hour ago, (laughs) but um, she kept in contact with Dov. He asked Sadie to take over the advanced game seminar, Mm -hmm. which is how they met. Yeah. Which she does. So she moves back to Massachusetts with the baby. Which is ironic because Sam was... Wanting, he was missing Massachusetts mm-hmm. at the time. He never wanted to go back to LA. I don't think either of them did, really. No, not really. But Aunt comes into town for something, mm-hmm. one of the gay producers, and meets with Sadie. And he asks, or Sadie asks, how is Sam? And he says his dad died. Mm-hmm. Grandpa, essentially. And um, she calls for the first time in like three years, calls Sam. And he doesn't pick up or respond. And she finds out about the funeral service and goes to it. And that's the first time they've seen each other since she said, get out of my house, which was about three years ago. And they do this thing. And they do it every time of just acting like nothing really happened. Yep. But knowing something did. Yeah. So they just like keep it out of distance. Mm -hmm. But they're also like, hey. It's self-preservation. Yeah. They uh, don't want to go there with each other. Well, it's their damn faults that they're ruining it. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) and that's the whole thing. Like, if they chose differently... Each of them individually chose differently, then we would have a different outcome. But that's what this whole book is about. They made the choices that they right. made. And just like in a game, you make choices as do the characters in this book. And depending on the choices that you make, just like in Solution, the game that Sadie made, just like any video game that they created together, just like in real life, like your choices have a different ending depending on which choice you make. And there's no really good or bad choices. They're just choices. Yeah. Right. And so, I don't know. There's just, like, a whole lot of self-preservation. They need therapy. (laughs) (laughs) They need to, like you said, they just, at the end of the day, there was a lot that needed to be said that was never said between them. Yeah. And that was the main thing with Sam is that he never told Sadie how he felt. I mean, he said it, like, in other ways. Like, with what he did for her and things like that. He did make it a point to say that's how he thought love was supposed to be shared. Yeah. Which just goes to show how incredibly damaged <laughs> Sam was. Yeah. I mean, and at the end, I think in this this phone call they have, mm-hmm. when he says thanks for coming, essentially, he says, I love you. And she says, I know. I love you, too. Yeah, or that's when they're in the airport. Or the airport, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, is that Sadie acted like Sam never loved her, 
But she knew. But this whole damn time she knew. Yeah. I think more so than anything, because even in the book's description, it says, this is a love story, but not one that you've heard before. Yeah. Facts. That's true. What it comes down to is that Sam and Sadie's view of love, view of marriage, view of what the normal definition of love and affection for one another is not what a standard person's definition would be. Yeah. Like, it was stated from the very beginning that the love that they felt for each other was something beyond friendship, something beyond romance. Yeah. It was fate. Yeah. It was fate that all these horrible, terrible things happened to Sam and he ended up in the hospital. It was fate that Sadie's sister Alice had cancer and she just happened to walk in the game room that day. Yeah. It was fate that they ended up at two Boston colleges. Mm -hmm. It was fate that Sam saw Sadie in the subway station that day. And therefore it was fate on and on that Sadie and Marks got together, that Sadie got pregnant, that they made all these games together. And throughout that journey... We really see the definition of their love, like, ultimately put to the test, but also understood through their experiences that only they can understand within each other. They know that while, like, the last scene in the airport, when Sam finally says, I love you, Sadie, and she says, I know I love you, too, that they may not see each other for many years, Mm -hmm. but regardless of that, They know and they understand the love that they have for each other. Yeah. That cannot be replaced by anyone or anything. Right. Yeah. I think, yeah, like what you just said is they love and know each other on a level that probably very few people could understand. Yeah. And that kind of poses the question, what do you think happens? After this. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. We're left off with Sam and Sadie getting on the airplane. Mm -hmm. Sam watched Sadie disappear into the connecting tunnel, and then he looked down at the drive. The game was called Ludo Sextus. Sadie had handwritten the title. He would know her handwriting anyway. So we know that their in-game child was called Ludo Quintus, which means game five. And so Ludo Sextus means game six. I am on the optimistic side of things, and I'm going to choose that while Sam and Sadie may never be together in the traditional romance sense that we find in so many novels, that creatively, imaginatively, their souls will be together. Yeah. (laughs) And... That will be shown through what they create and what they design together. And whether that means that Sam is going to end up in Massachusetts or they never move in together or they never even occupy the same 10 feet with each other, I think that is what I'm choosing to believe. What happens? What about you? What do you think? They end up together. They end up together, they have lots of sex and babies, and they have genius children, and their children go to MIT and Harvard and continue to make games, yeah. <laughs> no, I, it's it's more of a Dr. Daedalus and yes. Emily Marks, which also yes. brilliant names. Those I'm, are cute names. At first, I couldn't figure out, I was like, Marks, why'd she choose that? And Because it's written, the character's name is M-A-R-X. Her character and the game of the game is m-a-r-k-s yeah and so it wasn't until like halfway through i was like oh (laughs) yeah and i think that's when because you know i was confused at that part at first i think that's when all the pieces kind of dropped into place but i think it is a we are both lonely and we don't know how to do this Mm -hmm. and the only person that could have understood me in a romantic way is dead. Yeah. So let us occupy the space together and hopefully 
just talk a little bit. Yeah, make something good. Communicate just a smidgen. Yeah. And they'll be a lot happier. (laughs) Just a smidgen. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, there needs to be a smidgen of therapy. There needs to be a smidgen of PTSD treatment. There needs to be a smidgen of antidepressants. I don't know. They need to just get some help. They need to, yeah. I thought it was interesting that he gave his dog Prozac, but he wouldn't take yeah. it himself. <laughs> I know dog Prozac. I was Which, like, by all means, if your dog is depressed, get, get you some dog get Prozac. Them, get them help. But, yeah, I mean. Help yourself too, though. <laughs> yeah, like, he wouldn't, he couldn't stand to see his dog suffer. Yeah. When he himself was suffering so deeply. Yeah. And, you know, I thought it was really interesting that he named the game Pioneers when the conversation that he and Sadie had last had was basically him getting onto her like, what, do you think you're a pioneer of grief? Do you think you've never... Oh. Yeah. Do you think you've never experienced this thing before? And he named the game Pioneers. And they were pioneering their healing together in the game. That's what I got from it. That's cute. Yeah. So I... Yeah, I choose to think that they continue creating together yeah. and that is the existence that brings them the most happiness and the most peace yeah i think if either of them are going to be human <laughs> they have to create together yeah and what do you think about ichigo three mm. i think they decide to let the company do it like i think they oversee it as producers but ultimately they let the story continue. Yeah. It makes sense that Ichigo would continue. Yeah. I was hoping that um, Ludo Sextus was Ichigo 3. Oh, yeah. But maybe, it, like, maybe she had just written that as the title, but it was designed for Ichigo 3. Like, her her thoughts on what it should yeah. look like. Yeah. I don't know. Because that's their child. That's who they are. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was there before Naomi. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, so what's your rating? What are you rating this bad boy? So, as Alex knows, I don't like to rate until I've had at least two weeks to, <laughs> to marinate. And like I said, I just finished this book today. We've been marinating five hours, baby. <laughs> but if I had to rate it now, and I guess I'm going to, it would be a five out of five. What about you? Hell yeah. Five out of five. Obviously, I I am not one to marinate. I am one to, this is how I feel raw and in the moment. Yeah. So this is what I'll rate it. Um, But yeah, I think even a couple weeks from now, I will stick true to that. It's just such a well-written book. The writing was amazing. The character design, amazing. The plot itself, amazing. You just don't really see many of these books invoking such a strong emotional response in yeah. people or they do have that strong emotional response but it's not written as well right Zevin does both and what I thought she did well is and this also may be another reason why I felt like I liked Sam more is I felt he developed a lot more yeah absolutely he but to be fair he had a lot farther to grow than Sadie originally did yeah um, so you can see, like, he, he makes it a point to say, I love you once he realizes that that was wrong, that yeah. he didn't say it. Uh, or he, like, continues to be, like, holding his hand out for her. And she keeps, she's the one who shoves it away. Yeah. So I think, yeah. Overall, Sam was my favorite character. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're diving into the characters. Perfect. Yeah, Sam. Sam was a good one. Okay, so I wrote down every word I didn't know in the book. Okay. <laughs> so I could look it up. Like, yeah. I just would write it in my notes and then, like, do the look up feature. Yeah. 53 words <laughs> that I had to look up. <laughs> I will say when the first couple of chapters were definitely, like, vocabulary heavy. Yes. And I felt like maybe Zevin thought that because she was writing a story about a person who went to school at Harvard and a person who went to school at MIT that the story itself had to be super intellectual I think it could have toned that down a little bit 
Because there was quite a lot that I did not know either. So when I look back at it, a lot of it has different like uses that could be for gaming. Mm -hmm. So I think that was what she was trying to do. Yeah. And also she's probably smart and wanted to show off her words. Yeah. And you know, as she should, you go girl. If you know those words, period. Queen shit. Um, if you didn't know, (laughs) uh, my note says, I hate Sadie Sam forever. (laughs) So, as if we couldn't already guess that already. I don't and think you have to like, write it down. Like <laughs> That was in, like, chapter two. I stopped taking oh, notes. Oh, uh, my God. Okay. Well, we know who's Megan's favorite. We know who's her least favorite. Let, slide in those DMs. Let me know if you agree. Yeah, Mom and Dad. Slide into <laughs> our DMs. Um, you know, I don't really... I think I'm going to be fine with not having a favorite character in this book. Yeah. I don't think I have a least favorite and I don't think I have a favorite. Typically I do in books, um, but I feel like that these characters were both so perfect and imperfect at the same time that I don't want to pick and choose. So therefore, I will choose none. Yeah. I would say if... Well... The dog's my favorite. <laughs> Tuesday's my favorite character. <laughs> if I had to pick a favorite, I would probably pick Dong Hyun. Yeah. So that's it. This was a lot. We covered a lot. We covered, like, the whole book, basically. Was that not the point? No, that definitely was the point. <laughs> but there was just layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer in this book. I just, I think it truly deserves a five out of five. Absolutely. And I highly recommend it. I highly recommend. I think everyone can get something out of it. I don't think I would recommend it to a friend who doesn't read that often. No. This is not like a starter book. No. No. Because I have a lot of friends who are like, oh, I love reading. And I'm like, here's like 30 books. And they're like, I read one book a year. And I'm like, oh, don't read this one then. Yeah. Yeah. Because... No, you need to be an avid reader. You need to love complex and tragic stories. Yeah. And you have to somewhat be, like, into some intellectual aspects to read this book, for sure. Five out of five. Highly recommend. What do we got next, Megan? Give it to the people. Up next, we have... I'm glad my mom died by Jeanette <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Woohoo! Um, Another mom. devastatingly sad book. Yeah. <laughs> tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy. We did not intend for that, but um, you'll but be it... listening to it uh, a week apart, so you have time to emotionally heal. Prepare. Yeah. And if you are my mom, listen, it's a good read. And it was healing. And just so you know, I would not be glad if you died, but. I would be very sad if my mom died. Yeah. All moms, please don't die. Yeah, please don't die. But good solid read from Jeanette McCurdy. So that'll that'll be next. Yep. Uh, And we will catch you in a week. Yay. Uh, Please rate us on Spotify. Oh, our, um, our, okay. So our email. Yeah. Is is at goat, A-T-G-O-A-T, pod. So like all the good ones are taken, pod. At gmail.com. And our Instagram is at GoatPod. We will be posting things there eventually. And yeah, thank you for listening. This has been All the Good Ones Are Taken. Yay. Woo.